and are screwing up. This is a power point. Okay, thank you. This is what Dick really likes to do. Well, this is after me. Lou wrote this down, so how true it is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it says a brief introduction. All right. Lou Martin was an Air Force pilot for 20 years, nine of which were overseas. He has blocked 19,000 flight hours, including 169 combat hours in Vietnam. He retired in 1970 as a rank of lieutenant colonel. Hey, his son is that, too. He retired, did he retire? He retired also. Yeah. Colonel Martin graduated from the University of Maryland, holds airline transport pilot certificates with the U.S., Japan, and Iran, and has written three books. We all know that. <laughs> so here's Lou Martin, and he also has his own stopwatch. But we don't know if it's accurate. Hey, Lou, where is your Name tag. Yeah. Oh, everybody's supposed to have a name tag, according to Miss Parker. Yeah. I don't want to violate any rules. <coughs> oh, I brought my name tag. <laughs> he also brought his own stopwatch. <laughs> 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 Today, and also the Empress Farah, 
the Shaw's widow. She bought four copies. Showed good judgment on her part. <laughs> Today we have sold approximately 2,300 copies, which is not bad. Including a copy by Hollywood when they made the movie Argo. They called me and we had several phone conversations about the movie. Not a bad movie, but it's not actually true. However, to set the stage, I would like to provide a brief history of Iran. Following World War I, England became developing the, began developing the Persian oil fields. However, in 1925, after experiencing problems with the Qajar dynasty, they supported a coup d'etat and installed a running army colonel as the ruling monarch for Shah. After taking power, he changed the name of the country to Iran. That answers John's question at my table. And began forming a modern secular nation, similar to what Atatürk did in Turkey, when he ousted the Ottoman Empire in 1921. Unfortunately, he developed close relations with Germany and was supportive of Adolf Hitler. Therefore, in June 1941, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, England and Russia forced him to abdicate. They installed in his replacement his 22-year-old son, Mohammed Reza Pauli. He was educated in the West and sympathetic to the Western lifestyle. In 1942, the Soviet Union, England, and the U.S. stationed troops in Iran. And in 1943, he declared war on the Axis powers. When World War II ended, the British and American troops withdrew. However, the Soviet Union indicated that their troops would remain in the northern section. However, President Truman, we were the only country that had the atomic bomb at that time, forced them to leave. This resulted in a bond of friendship with the U.S. and the Shah, who was now able to continue the modernization programs initiated by his father. This irritated the Islamic fundamentalists, who accused him of denigrating the Islamic religion. They wanted Iran to remain an Islamic theocracy and preserve the Muslim traditions of the 14th century. This mindset made it possible for the Ayatollah Khomeini to overthrow the Shah in 1978 and 79. The 1980 Egyptian, the 1980 eight-year Iran-Iraq War, the 1980 assassination of the Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. 9-11 WCT attacks, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, the overthrow of the Egyptian and Libyan presidents Mubarak and Gaddafi, and the rise of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. In March, now is where I come in. In March 1975, my contract with Japan Airlines was ending, and a friend asked me if I was interested in the job with Iran Air. He said that he worked with the chief pilot and would write a letter of recommendation that I could send to him along with a copy of my resume. After receiving no response from him, I sent him a telegram stating, I'm preparing to return to the U.S. Would it be helpful for me to visit your office? Now get this. His one word response was, yes. I received a message with one word, yes. I purchased a round trip job ticket from Tokyo to Tehran and left the next day. <clears throat> After arriving in Tehran, I telephoned his office, and his secretary told me to be in his office at 10 a.m. the next morning. Early the following day, I checked out of my hotel and took a taxi to Mirabad Airport. Sitting behind a large desk was a distinguished-looking man in his late quarters. He said, and I'm quoting him, show me your pilot's envelope. After thumbing through a few pages, he said, quote, do you have a Boeing 727 or Boeing 707 type rating? When I answered no, he said, sorry, I can't use you. My anticipated job interview was over in 30 seconds. In a stern voice, I said, Captain Abdullah, why in the hell did you have me travel 5,000 miles to determine that I did not have a Boeing 727 or Boeing 707 rating? This information was clearly noted on my resume, which you obviously did not read. I picked up my pilot's logbook and started to leave his office. 
He called me back and asked me to have a seat. He admitted that he had not read my resume and assumed that I would have the aircraft readings that he desired. He apologized and asked me what type of aircraft I had been flying in Japan. I said, a Japanese YS-11 turboprop. He said that he had a friend who was the managing director of a fleet of turboprops in Iran and may wish to speak to me. And if I was interested, he would give him a call. I said, please do. His phone call was in Farsi, but with occasional references in English to Captain Martin and Japan Airlines. When he hung up, he said that a Mr. Jahan Bani, Muhammad Jahan Bani, would like to do, meet me. And his secretary would arrange for a company car to drive me to his office. Sitting in an air-conditioned office was a distinguished-looking man dressed in a suit and tie. As I walked in, he stood up, thrust out his hand, said, Salam Maleko, you must be Captain Martin. Captain Abdulia said that you were looking for a flying job in Iran. Have a seat and tell me about your aviation background. When I finished, he asked me if I had a Fokker F-27 typewriter as a Dutch aircraft. When I said no, he said that he could use a pilot in my experience, was very, but very sorry that he could not offer me a job. Hell, I just gone through this type of rejection, so I thought I would try a different approach. I said, Mr. John Bonnie, the F-27 is very similar to the aircraft I flew in Japan. I could easily check out in it. He asked me how long I thought it would take. I told him, following the self-study program of the flight manual, no more than five hours. He said that he was interested in if I could perform in that manner. He could offer me a job. He offered me a job at $36,000 a year. That was some time ago. That would be equivalent to $165,000 a year today. He said that his personnel manager, Mr. Monpass, remember that name, Mr. Monpass, would complete my job application. After filling out several forms and making copies of my licenses, passport, and medical, I signed a two-year contract. He said that the hiring process would take four to six months, as I would have to receive a solid police clearance and an approval from the Shah's government. He said that the strict security clearance was required as they fly members of the royal family and high-ranking military and civilian VIPs into sensitive military bases. With my job application complete, he said that there was no need for me to remain in Iran. I told him that if I was able, hoping, that I was hoping to make the evening job flight to Tokyo and would appreciate transportation to downtown Tehran. He said, no problem, Captain, and called for a company car. After leaving the airport, my frustrated NASCAR driver started heading north, not towards the city. My repeated objections in English seemed to upset him, but did not change his direction of driving. Suddenly, he came to a screeching stop, pulled my suitcase out of the trunk, and set it on the side of the road. When I exited the vehicle to check on what he was doing, he jumped into the driver's seat and took off. Here, standing on the side of an Iranian rural road, dressed in a suit and tie, carrying the suitcase and sweating profusely, I wondered, what the hell do I do now? Therefore, I did the only thing I could, America could think of. I started hitchhiking. <laughs> Curious Iranian drivers did not stop, but actually seemed to speed up when they approached my position. Suddenly, a late model show stopped. The driver rolled down his window and in perfect English asked me if I was an American. When I said that I was, he said, what the hell are you doing walking on the outskirts of Terra? I told him that it was a long story, but if he was heading downtown, I would appreciate a ride. He said again in English, throw your bag in the back seat and hop in. I explained to him how I happened to be stranded on a rural highway. He didn't seem surprised. I asked him where he had learned his English. He said that he had attended college in the U.S., was well, excuse me, well treated, and was glad to be able to reciprocate. He dropped me off in front of the job downtown ticket office in Tehran. I was not able to obtain a seat on the job flight, so the agent suggested that he endorse my ticket to Iran Air. 
They have daily flights to Tokyo. However, I was somewhat concerned. This was in 1975. I was somewhat, somewhat concerned as the flight would make a refueling stop in Peking. And I did not have a Chinese transit visa. But I had to get back to Tokyo. In 1975, the U.S. and China were in a fierce fight over established diplomatic relations. And U.S. citizens had experienced problems when flying through China. We landed at Peking. As soon as the door was open, a Chinese officer and five enlisted men, guard, walked down the airplane. He went down the aisle checking his passports. When he came to my, my position, he said, Passport, please. I handed him the passport. He checked for visas. He says, You have no visa for China. You must come with me. I said, No, I'm not going with you. He says, You must come with me. And his guards got a little closer. I remember from my course in international law in college, I said, the United States and China may not have diplomatic relations, but Iran and China does, and I'm on Iranian territory, and I'm not leaving this aircraft. He stopped off carrying my passport. I buzzed the overhead, and I had the steward come, and I said, I have to talk to the Iranian captain. He came back, and I told him what happened. I said, if we land in Tokyo and I don't have a passport, I'm in trouble, you're in trouble, and so is the Iran air. He says, let me make a radio call. About 10 minutes later, this Chinese officer came back. He handed my passport and said, we give you one-time visa in China. Please do not come back to China again. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the flight to Tokyo was no problem. I returned to Wisconsin, and six months later, received a package containing airline tickets and a letter stating that I had been approved for employment in Iran. I was instructed to present my letter and passport to the Iranian Council Office in San Francisco to obtain a working visa. I have to have a little bit of chin. Gross. What is that in the Iranian? Chin and tonic. <laughs> chin and <one> piece. <coughs> to obtain a working visa in San Francisco. I scheduled one day for the Council Office and made reservations for a flight to Tehran following day. After presenting my documents to the council clerk, I was told to come back in three weeks. Shocked, I requested to speak to the office manager. I showed him my authorization letter and told him that the Shah was expecting me in Tehran. Good explanation. The Shah was expecting me in Tehran in three days. And if he was going to delay, going to delay my scheduled arrival date, he should send a message to the Shah explaining the reasons. He requested that I take a seat in the waiting room that I had my visa one hour later. After arriving in Tehran, I was not able to contact an English speaking person in the air, tra air, air taxi office. Therefore, I took a taxi to their operations center. My personnel department friend that I met before met me at the security gate and said, Typical Iranian. He said, Captain Martin, if you had advised us of your arrival date, I would have met you at the airport. When I told him that I'd sent him a message and that I was on schedule, he responded, and we'll talk about this later, he responded, Anshla Allah, and escorted me to the BFB lounge and said, take a seat. About 30 minutes later, the chief pilot, Captain Ayub Khan, they're all from Mohammed. Mohammed Ali Khan, came in and presented me with a Fulker F-47 manual. He said that since the VIP lounge was not in use, I could make myself comfortable and start my self-study program. However, after flying 10,000 miles, I was fighting severe jet lag, so I told him that I was dead tired, needed a shower and something to eat, so why don't I obtain a hotel room and after resting to start my self-study program? And when I felt ready for the written F-27 exam, I could give him a call. His response, good idea. <laughs> three days later, three days later, I called Captain Ayub Khan and told him I was ready for the exam. He sent a car to pick me up, and I passed the Iranian government exam with 85% grade. The chief pilot then informed me that my first F-27 instruction flight was scheduled for 10 a.m. the following morning. He said that my instructor, 
would be an Iranian Air Force colonel, commanding him. Having never been in an F-27 cockpit, I arrived early and was pleased to note that the switches and knobs match what I had been studying. At 10 a.m. sharp, a blue staff car with a flashing red light stopped next to the aircraft. Out popped a dashing-looking Iranian Air Force bird colonel, dressed in a tailor-made flight suit covered with colorful patches. He looked to me like a member of the Air Force Thunderbirds. He thrust out his hand and said, Salam alaykum wa shabay. You must be Captain March. He said, is the pre-flight complete? I said, no, I was waiting for your arrival to know what your, your intentions are. He said, you check the right side of the aircraft, I'll check the left side of the aircraft, and we'll meet in the cockpit. I rushed around the right side, and when I came back, he was already in the right seat. I strapped him in the left seat, he said, start the engine, oh, I said, before, before starting the engines, checklist. He says, checklist complete, start the engines. So I started the engines, and I said, taxi check. He said, taxi check complete, taxi. So we taxied out that room, and I said, before takeoff check. He said, before takeoff check complete, take off. I'd been in the airplane about 10 minutes. We took off, made a left turn, climbed the 15,000 feet, went through normal procedures, approach stalls, sleep turns, and so on. And we flew two hours, went back to the airport. He said, we do the same thing tomorrow. So the next day when he arrived, he says, check this. I said, check this complete. <laughs> and I climbed the left seat, and I said, without saying anything, I started the engines. And I didn't ask for any checklist, and I said, get taxi instructions. And we took off, flew those two hours. The next day, we flew one hour for my final check ride to make the five-hour equipment after one hour. He says, you okay? Good pilot. He says, what do you think about night flying? I said, if it gets dark, I turn on the lights. He says, good answer. Check right complete. <laughs> <laughs> so now, I, I, I was a qualified captain in the F-27. I found an apartment with a Western-style toilet for 500 a month for about 2,100 today. It met my immediate boss, Captain Bokari, a retired Pakistani Air Force colonel. After a few line qualification, qualification flights, I was a fully qualified captain for a taxi company. In January 1976, I was one of 40,000 American expatriates working and living in Tehran. They included American military members and their families and experts from most professional fields needed to assist the Shah in modernizing Japan. I excuse me, Iran. Tehran in 1976, that was two years, two years before the revolution, was still a friendly city for foreigners, but becoming an offensive venue for Islamic fundamentalists. I began an active flight schedule and was soon qualified in all four aircraft types, which we'll show later. I would fly six out of the seven days to the Persian Gulf, the Caspian Sea, oil fields, photo mapping missions, and restricted military bases. My passengers were members of the royal family, military and civilian VIPs, and scruffy looking oil workers. Each day was a different mission, a different type of aircraft, and different passengers. I could purchase airline discount tickets, and I arranged for my Japanese flight attendant friend, Chieko, my future wife, to visit me as well as my daughter and son, which were going to be here today, but their mother died. I was content with living in Iran, but being a pilot in the turbulent Middle East was far different than flying for the polite, truthful, well disciplined Japanese who considered even a, a civil mistake repugnant, versus the Iranians who believe that there is no such thing as a lie. I think a ubiquitous philosophy shared by our, our, our politician. <laughs> that everything is preordained by Allah, so why worry to say Anshua Allah? But drastically changed in the fall of 1978 when efforts to overthrow the Shah became bloody and dangerous. I will comment on a few instances, and then after that we'll show a few slides and see how much time I have left. No, we're doing all right. I've talked about the expression Anshua Allah. It means Allah's bidding. So everything is preordained. So trying to teach flight safety to someone that believes everything is preordained, they say, why, well, here, Anshua Allah. 
The Iranian bail system was terrible. It would take five or six weeks to get a letter, if at all. I, we were approaching the Easter season, and they had a small BX there, an Army, U.S. Army BX, and I bought an Easter egg covering set. Because when I went to get a, a mailbox, the sergeant says, you have a gray ID card, retired. You need a green ID card to get a mailbox. Well, my gray ID card happened to fall into a boiling hot cup of green dye. <laughs> and after it sat there a while, and it was cool enough so I could pull it out, I let it dry, my card was green. So I went back to the Army and I got a mailbox, which I got for the three years I was there. The use of bakshis in Iran, everything is under the table payment. In addition to the lie, if I talk to Roll and tell Roll a bold faced lie, and he believes it, and he finds out later that I lied to him, he's not upset with me. He bought the story. And I can give you some examples about that if we have time later, if you're still awake. And then, uh, besides that, the bakshis, everything's under table payments. When I went to register my Volkswagen, I had a young Iranian co-pilot as my interpreter. And we started to leave. And the, and the Iranian co-pilot said, Captain Bakshish, under table paper. I said, how much? He said, 1,000 real. So I took 1,000 real to the application. As we left, I said, how long would it take me to get my application if we didn't put Bakshish? He says, never. We never received it. In 1978, which I talk about in the book, my future wife, Chago, Japanese, she got a job in Tehran with her, on her own with a Japanese company. This is before the revolution. And in November, when things really got bad, they moved the Japanese out two hours' notice. They moved their whole group out. I had been trying to call her where she lived in this community, Japanese community, and I had no answer before I answered machines. Later that evening, she called me, and the phone, was, the phone connection was kind of dead. And I said, where are you? She says, I'm in London. So they pulled them out with two hours notice. Now mm -hmm. maybe, Roger, we should <coughs> still show a few slides. These are the four aircraft that I was flying. The Fairchild M27, the American version, the Iranian, the F-A shooting zone built by Fairchild, the Rockwell, Turbo Commander, which is, I uh, usually fly single pilot, which is a lot of fun. And then the Falcon Jet. I want to say a word about the Falcon Jet. I had a lot of jet time from the Air Force, so the chief pilot wanted me to wrap and check out the Falcon. I was reluctant to check out the Falcon, not because it's not a good airplane, but the Falcon Jet, our passenger goes in maybe 30 minutes to the, what I had to call sit all day reading magazines, so I wasn't getting any overtime. So uh, I had an agreement with the chief pilot that I could fly as a fill-in for the Falcon, not because of a good airplane. Next slide. That's me with a mustache in Iran. And I want to say a word about this young co-pilot. His name is Sepi Rizada. Now listen to this. This was 38 years ago. Two months ago, he called me on the telephone. I said, he, first, and he said, are you Lou Martin, the fool in Iran? I said, yeah. He says, well, I'm Sebi Rizada. I said, my God, where are you? He said, I work for a, for a flight school down in Dallas, Texas. He said, about 1991, I was able to finally get out of Iran on the excuse that I was going to the States for training. And I never went back. So he called me 38 years after we flew together. And to show that he was still a young, intelligent pilot, now he's in his 60s, but he had enough appreciation for literary art that he bought all three of my books. <laughs> <laughs> so I still had to compliment him. <laughs> Next slide. This, this, on the fiction of London, Bill Ashton, my friend Jameson. Take a note on Bill Ashton. I think we'll have enough time. I want to talk later about Bill Ashton. He was an English. Both these guys were about 10 years my senior. 
1940, when I was 12 years old in the Battle of Britain, these guys were 22 and flying for the RAF in the Battle of Britain. Bill Hess on the left, he shot down a couple of 109s. And I'm going to talk about him, really an interesting guy. I got both of these guys out of this wiki, wiki biscuit. Wiki, what is it? Sticky wicket. Sticky wicket. That same with the, the right here, flat edge on it, on my lap. Keep my knees warm. Next slide. <laughs> This is my future wife. This is when she got a job on her own in Iran. That's the boat lighter that I abandoned along with months of pay and, and overtime and so on. I just lived everything. This is at, at the Army base, north in part of Terra. Next. These two guys are this, the one on the left is Jim Wallace. He flew the Falcon. Then he went to work for United afterwards in Miami, Florida. That's his young wife, Lynn. When Jim was on a trip, she couldn't even go out the door about being fathered by that ready and then. She was afraid to leave the door, when, to leave the house when he was out of the The one on the left is Rich Reeves. He was an Air Force lieutenant that took his discharge in Iran. He got a job with Iran, the same company I did. And that's his Iranian wife, Giddy. Next slide. This is me and my my daughter, Lynn, who I came back to Iran, I took her out on a flight and had her to do set over the Alps. She kept saying, are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? Get over the Alps? And I said, well, I did yesterday. <laughs> Next slide. Either way. That's my son. He was 16 years old when I got him to the ground. And I took him on a, on a, ice, on a restricted strip down to Cark Island. The radiant said, you can't take your son with you on that flight. I said, watch me. So I put him on the air flight and took him to the car back the next slide. I put him in the cockpit of this long haired 16 year old. He's a pilot now for United Airlines. He's read my books too, which showed them good judgment. <laughs> next slide. This is my wife, my future wife in Isfahan. At one time he used to be the capital of Iran about five hundred years ago. Next slide. This is me. I think that's where I got partners with uh, mixing all these martinis. <laughs> <laughs> that's me and my partner in Iran drinking a martini. Next slide. That's Diego when she worked there in Iran on her own. This is my partner. Next slide. This is my Iranian ID card. How are we doing in time? We're doing okay. Um, yeah, no problem. Or oh, more than that. Well, we've got 15 minutes. One o'clock. Oh. Well, oh, I can do it in 15 minutes. I want to talk about. <laughs> I want to talk about Bill Astin. I showed you his picture earlier. Now, how you get involved in these things in books is really, really interesting. In 2013, I received an email from a gal, now had to be in her 60s, late 60s probably, from England. She said, she said that she had been doing a Google search on Iran and pulled up my books, Wings of Persia, so she ordered a copy out of the London office, was there on the computers. And she said she was surprised to see in the book that I talked about Bill Aston. She said when she was 20 years old, she fell in love with Bill Aston, who was now in his early 30s. and was a race car driver. And she wanted to marry him, but he, he wouldn't get a divorce. She said he was divorced with two kids. And finally she gave up on him, and she left. And said she's not going to see him anymore. She said, but now she was interested to read about Bill Aston in my book and wanted to, <clears throat> wanted to know if I knew where he was. I said, well, the last I heard, then he'd moved to Canada, but I didn't have his address. About the same time frame, I received an email from a guy named Joe, I don't remember his last name, in Canada. He was doing the same thing, he was doing a Google search in Iran, and my book came up. 
just like in Hollywood when they had the movie Argo. He said, my book came out in Iran. And he read in there about Bill Aston. He said he knew Bill Aston in Canada. He said he had, when he'd come to Canada, he got a job at the National Transportation Safety Board, or a branch like the FAA in Canada. And he said he worked with him for about 10 years. He said he knew his second wife, Myrna, who I had met a couple times when she came to Tehran to visit. And we went out to dinner together. He said he knew Bill, and he knew his wife, Myrna. And Bill had died in 1990 at age 72 while well, he was a heavy drinker and a heavy smoker. But he died in 1990. And she said, and he said that he enjoyed reading my book. Again, showing good intelligence on his part. He said he enjoyed reading my book. And he said he knew he had furnished his second wife's address, but he didn't have her email. And he said he, he's quite sure that she would enjoy a copy of my book. And he gave her her phone number. So I called Myrna. And we had a discussion. I said, would you like a copy of my book? She said, I love it. So I sent her a copy of Wings Over Persia. And, and I got a letter. She didn't have an email, but I got a letter back from her. She said there were two things that she didn't like about the book. One, she didn't like the, the incident that I told about Bill when he was flying the National Iranian Copper Company's president to Kerbin. On that flight, on that flight, after he made that flight, Bill called me at my apartment. He said, I have to come over and see you. So I said, well, come on over. I got a full bottle of black and scotch. And I said, what happened on your flight? He said, well, he said, when I came back, it was night. And they told me, told me that the airplane was all ready. And that a copper company, Bush F-27 to fly the president of his company to Kerbin. He said, the dispatcher told me the co-pilot's on the airplane. The pre-flight pre has been made. It's all ready to go. All you had to do is sign and climb the airplane and go. So he said he went to the airplane, taxied out, asked for takeoff instructions, and they cleared number one. He went to check the controls, and the ailerons wouldn't move. He said he could move the rudders and the pitch, but he couldn't move the ailerons. He said he took a flashlight. It was at night. He said he looked out on the left, and there was a gust lock was still installed on the left aileron, with the streamer hanging down. And he says, right behind him was a Pan Am 747 he turned his taxi lights on, waiting to take off, and he was blocked the yeah, taxiway. You see, he had to go through the passengers, get in the back of the airplane, get this long aluminum pole, put it together, go outside and move the gust lock, climb back in the airplane, then went to Kirkland. This is, he was telling me this about 9 o'clock at night. He said, I don't know what the chief pilot's going to say. He says, I'm sure he'd be pissed off. I said, well, I don't think he'll be too happy. I had a flight the next day. When I came back, Bill, he said, I've been calling you. He said, I have to come over and see you. Well, what I was concerned about, that morning, I went to the airport with my flight, and the chief pilot said, did, did you hear what happened to Captain Aston last night? And I said, no, I didn't hear what happened. And he told me about this incident. He said he, he said, received a phone call from the tower chief, Pan Am, station manager, and the copper company office complaining about this problem. Here's the pilot ready to take off his controls a lot. And the chief pilot, the radio chief pilot says, I don't know what to do. He said, maybe I should fire him and fight him, look ground him for a couple of months. I said, no, I don't do any of that, Captain. He said, he was out. I said, just write him a letter and the management and tell me we're going to keep it on file for six days. He said, well, he said, would you write the letter? And I said, well, I can't. I have a flight. He said, don't worry about your flight. So I sat down and I wrote a letter Longhand. And I said, I'll give this to you for two promises. One, you never tell Bill Aston what happened, who wrote the letter, and you have it typed in English, and you sign it. He said, I'll, I'll do that. So the following day, Bill said he had to come over. I thought, my God, that, that, chief, that great chief pilot told him who wrote the letter. And I came over and built it up the second floor. He, he said, God damn blue. He said, Look at this stupid goddamn letter that, that the Iranian chief pilot gave me. He said, I've never been so insulted since I was shot down over Paris. He said, I've never been so, look at this damn letter. So I looked at the letter, it's exactly what I wrote. And I knew then that the, the, cat, the chief pilot hadn't told me who wrote it. 
And I said, Bill, that's not really a bad letter. It didn't cost you any money. You haven't been fired. I said, actually, there, there are several places in the letter that complimented you for your all experience. He said, yeah, and a couple more drinks of scotch, and he left, and he said, well, maybe it's not so bad. Now, going back to his wife, after she read the book, she said she took exception to that story about his <coughs> copper company flight. And she says, you spent too much time in it, and I don't think it's true. And she said, your description of his shoot down over Paris is completely false. Now, if you read the book, and you have the good sense to read the book, I stated in the book exactly what Bill told me. He said when I was making a night reconnaissance flight in January 1944 in a mosquito bomber, I was shot down. I don't spend much time on it, but I talk about it in the book. This is what he told me. And he said, I was picked up by the French underground, shuttled down to Spain, got back to England. Now his wife, Myrna, she tells me that is a complete fabrication. She said that the, that the flash bombs he was carrying were incorrectly stored and exploded immediately, killing the armor as he did not have his parachute on and Bill was wearing his and was ejected. He flee free fell from 30,000 7,000 feet. After he landed, he was picked up by the Gestapo, was tortured. He ended up as a prisoner of war in Germany from January 19, January 1944 on. Now this is completely different than I had in my book. So I was, I was curious. I went and did a lot of research in the RAF pilots, prisoner of war pilots, and I found out that he was a prisoner. He was actually a prisoner of war. But the story that I could not undercover on the Google did not say that he was shot down at night, which he was, which he showed me his law book. And he, and he was not, it didn't, it didn't show that he'd been a prisoner and been interrogated. Oh, this, this is a family shot. I, wanted to, I mentioned I'm the sole survivor of, of a family of 12. That's me in uniform in 1968. All those people in that picture are gone except me. But none of them had Parkinson's. <laughs> next, next shot. Here's the shot that is the gal that said that she would fell in love with him when she was 20 years old and, and he wouldn't divorce his wife. She sent me that picture of Bill as a race car driver in England in the early 50s when he was in, in his early 30s. That sure looks like Bill Ashton. I guess that's a Jaguar, isn't it, Dick? No. Anyway, she says he was a Formula One racer. And she was a what? We've got six minutes before one. So anybody, any questions? Anybody have any questions about anything? Did you ever find out why the uh, driver dropped you off at the side of the road? I think, Jim, in the first place, we didn't speak the same language. And he was obviously, again, you can't believe the Iranians. And I believe he was given a different destination than taking me downtown. But it didn't come through in English. And when I saw him going north instead of downtown, I started harassing him in English. And I think it just upset him. And he didn't want to deal with it anymore. So I think the only way he figured he'd get rid of it was to stop the car, take my bag out of the trunk, and he probably knew I would get out of the car. And he took the bag out of the trunk and he just took off. So that's my only explanation. Dealing with those people, I want to mention, I said dealing with them when you can't believe them is really, really hard to get by, hard to learn. I want to give you one example. The crew bus would generally drop me off right next to a brass shop. And the brass owner, he spoke fairly good English. And I would stop in there in uniform with my bag, and I'd sit down and Pour me a cup of chai, tea, and we'd just talk back and forth. There was a very attractive base that he had in the window, very ornate type of base. He wanted a hundred dollars for it. I had offered him fifty. Wasn't too serious, but that's typical. I said, "I'll give you fifty for it." No, 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 Captain. 
So when I stopped by for a talk, I said, you still have a pace, I'll give you $50 for it. No, no, no. One day, learning the, learning the system, the crew bus stopped next to the shop. He was standing in the doorway, didn't have any customers, obviously. I got out of the crew bus, carried my bag, and walked right past him. He's Captain. I said, no, 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 no. He said, come on, have some chai. I said, no, 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 no. So he caught up with me. He says, what's the matter? I said, I lost my job. I said, they fired me. I said, I'm going back to the States tomorrow. And I started to walk out. He says, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, well, that's the way it is. He said, don't you want that face? I said, no, 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 I don't have room for it. He said, you can have it for $50. So I gave him $50 for that base, my ex-wife got it. Which slide do you want? At the family? Oh, back. It doesn't matter. That one? Yeah, yeah. So a couple days later, the crew bus dropped me off, and this operator, proprietor, came out. He says, Captain, I thought you lost your job. I said, no, they changed their mind. <laughs> you know he had been had. I told him a better story. But we were still friends because he had lost. And that's the way you had to deal with it. And when you read my book, you find many examples of how I learned to deal with that. Very interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, over here. Yeah. I saw you drinking uh, some booze in, in Iran. How did you manage to get it in the country? Or was it, was it hard at that time to bring liquor in? What? To bring liquor into Iran, I mean, was it? Well, I was very fortunate because I was a U.S. citizen and I could use the, the commissary at the embassy. And we had the liquor store and my friend Bill Ashton, I'd buy him a scotch, John Walker Black Cajun, Black Scotch. So I could use the liquor store in, in the embassy. But before the revolution, we had the major hotels in Hilton, Hyatt, and other major, about seven major hotels that had happy hours in Tehran. That was one thing that really upset the Islamic fundamentalists. They had liquor stores. And one of the first things they smashed during the revolution in the fall of 1978 was smashing the liquor stores, the BMW garages, the Mercedes garages, and, the, and these liquor, liquor stores. So the hotels before the revolution, when Khomeini came in in January 1979, they no longer could sell liquor. Yeah, John. Uh, technical question. Your your story seems to focus in on the, on the Fokker, what, 127? Fokker 27. 27. But the aircraft on your book cover looks like an Aero Commander. So where does that uh, aircraft come in? Well, that was, please go back to the foreign airplanes that we would have brought. More back. Well, the, the, the first, first slide, second slide.
had to go beyond what they were saying. The only thing you could really trust was what you could see and touch. So would you say that situation exists today? It's the same today, the whole Middle East. I had one young co-pilot. We were getting ready for a fight. I went to push the start and start from the right engine, and the prop didn't turn. So I figured it was a starting drive. I had to get the maintenance out there, and he said it'd be about an hour. <clears throat> so we went inside, and this young co-pilot, he's, he's listening to rock and roll. He says, what's the latest captain? Are your airplanes ready? I says, not yet. He says, well, Anshala Allah. I said, I was going to have a little fun with him. I said, what do you mean, Anshala Allah? He says, well, Allah's bidding. Everything will be okay. He says, I'm good graces with Muhammad, so I don't have any problems. I said, well, let me give you a little example. I says, Anshala Allah, Allah Akbar, God is great. He says, hi. Right. I said, let's say we were rolling on the runway. And all of a sudden we look up and our fuel pressure, our oil pressure drops to zero. Do we say Anshala Allah and continue the takeoff? Or do we, we abort? He said, oh, that's a problem. I said, let me give you a little help. I said, Allah, Allah Akbar. Yeah, God is great. I says, Allah gave you a brain. Now in this situation, if you don't use that brain, you're going to piss them off. <laughs> So I said, in this case, use what Paula gave you, and before we have we have reached takeoff speed, you abort the takeoff. That's a good, that's a good answer. So that's the way you had to work around the Iranians. It's, and it's the same way today. They say we're not enriching the uranium. That's a bunch of bullshit. They're enriching, they're enriching the uranium. Whatever they tell you, if you believe it, it's no, it's like it's like the Germans. If you believe it, it's not a lie. It's like some of our politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Can you say that about the main That was in 1927, I think. <coughs> when, the, when the old, it was the, it was the Persia going back 2,500 years. So our, Educated men, men go back to about 1,000, 190,000 first educated Homo sapiens. Then Adam and Eve both the, bit the apple, and people have been eating apples and killing each other ever since. <laughs> so my solution to ending all the wars in the first place: stop all apples and make the minimum draft age of 45. <laughs> I know at 45 you're still healthy enough to fight, but you, but by that time you establish yourself. And you, you, you know, <laughs> make the minimum age even for the, for the West Point and the academies 45. So when they graduate to 49, people don't want to fight at that age. So all all apples and make the minimum age for the military 45, and we won't have all that in our wars. We're over time. Right? Anybody? Any other questions? John, did I answer your question about the turbo? Did you qualify in the turbo to fly that too? Oh yeah, I qualified all four aircraft. Including the Falcon? Yeah. And I mentioned, I, they were after me initially, John, to check out the Falcon because I came in with a lot of jet experience. But like I mentioned, I don't want to repeat myself, although I do sometimes. But the Falcon was 30 minute flights with VIPs. I was guaranteed 70 hours, and anything over that was overtime. So I was, by the logbook, was flying about 95 hours a month because the co-pilots would pad it a bit, but we didn't care. Did you, uh, did you fly that Rockwell as well as Bob Hoover did? No. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I was going into Bob Hoover in an interesting way. There. I was going to the boss one day in the turbo commander room. And off in the distance, I saw this airplane doing loops. As I got closer, there was a turbo commander doing loops and rolls. And I landed at the boss and I was narrating the captain. And I said, what the hell were you doing? He said, Anshalala. He said, I had some passengers on board that wanted new aerobatics. He said, so I sent them aerobatics with them. I took the number of the airplane and never fly it again because I'm afraid he fractured the wings.
But yeah, you could do aerobatics with it if you're Bob Hoover. It was a fun airplane. I talk about flying a Navy Admiral in that airplane down to a strip in the desert. And after I dropped him off, I had went back to Shiraz, all by myself, being paid thirty-some thousand a year, good salary, having a lot of fun in a single airplane, flying over the desert about five hundred feet, air conditioned. I thought, my God, what a wonderful life. This is before the revolution. And I came across a bunch of nomads. I looked down there, camels and goats and a bunch of people with tents and so on. So I thought I'd give them a thrill. So I flew right over the top of the camels and goats, mules all scattered. And I thought, they had so much fun, I'll do it again. <laughs> so I swung around and came back again about 300 knots, went right over the top of it. They're probably still talking about that. <laughs> and I flew back again. Before the that, that's what caused the revolution. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else? I have some books over here. You're probably wondering if it's possible you to buy a book if you have them. I have four left over here. They're only $18 and they don't charge my signature. And since it's raining outside, I've got a free plastic bag you can carry it in. <laughs>